Okay. <laughs> Something bad happened there, but now I think I'm live. Are we live? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bioconductor 2021 uh, Methodology and Statistics Short Talks. Um, we're going to start the short talks shortly, but first, a few housekeeping items. If you have questions for the speaker today, please enter them into the Q&A tab. You'll see that tab on the right. Be sure when you do so that you clarify who the question is for. Um, otherwise, it may be hard to know. Um, and so um, you also have the ability to upvote questions. Um, if you see a question on there that, and there's a lot of questions and you see one that you really particularly want to answer, you can upvote that. Um, if you would like to ask your question live, please use the raise hand feature and the moderator can bring you onto the digital stage. Um, there are a variety of emoticons, so you can give feedback. I see some of you have found those. I saw those floating off the top earlier. Um, if for some reason you have to leave early, early, a video of this session will be available in a couple of hours after the session is completed. Um, so now let me introduce our first speaker um, of the three that we have in this short talk session. Um, each of the speakers will have about 10 to 15 minutes. The first speaker is Wanson Moo who will be speaking about generating genomic null ranges via block bootstrap for overlap statistics across a range of effect sizes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen. Can anyone see this? Looks like everyone can see it. OK, great. So hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce non-ranges project like implementing the block bootstrapping idea. Uh, in, genome an in genome analysis, it is often interesting to know whether two feature sites are ha have strong association. For example, in genome enrichment analysis, when we have a differential expression gene set, we want to know that it's really close to a set of peaks. Then we will define a ranges uh, around transcription star site like 1KB to get the observed uh, overlap count or rate with the peaks. Then for drawing the statistical inference, we will do the Fisher shuffling or the Batu shuffle to randomly sample the peaks or the genes to get a, a a thousand non-site with the enrichment statistics. Then we will get the z-score and the p-value to derive the conclusion by assuming the non-enrichment statistics follow the no, uh, normal distribution. However, um, by doing this naive method, we're always ignoring the dependency between the positions like the gene code and encode shows here, gene and the cis regulatory elements are always displaced in a cluster manner. And also there will be high and low densities like splitted by the red line, which indicates there exist natural clumps and homogeneous properties in the genome. So if we simply shuffling the features by assuming they are independent, then the non-sites won't resemble the original value properties. A good example is given by the Bacos paper that shuffling and randomization can get really different uh, distributions from the true homogeneous distribution where the block bootstrapping are get um, much better performance on that. And to dealing with the non-homogeneous property, we would consider in the segmentation procedure first to define a large and relatively uh, seg homogeneous segment within which to do the block bootstrapping on features. This is a simple block bootstrap sketch that we have three chromosomes of different lines and the peaks are colored by the chromosome. Then we can randomly sample the blocks uh, indicated by the red bracket to across the genome so that features can appear zero times once or more than once. To realize how is the segmentation works, we first define three segmentation region, red, blue, and green, with the minimum length 100 base pair, uh, and color the 10 base pair dense picks by the segmentation region 
So then we can do the block bootstrap across the genomes within each segmentation region, uh, regardless the color depths. Then there comes several questions. How do we evaluate the segmentation effect? And how do we choose the segmentation length block length? And how does that influence the conclusion? So we have applied non ranges to a macro fetch data set aims for test the association between the differential expression genes and the differential accessibility peaks. The y-axis here is the variance of overlap count across a thousand times bootstraps that compute the overlap of D genes to the bootstrap peaks. Uh, if the data are homogeneous, then we we'll expect the variance would be flight across the block lens. However, we found out uh, do the block bootstrap without segmentation or the block permutation, the variance will increase largely as the block length increases. But if we use either circular binary segmentation or hidden Markov model segmentation with proportional block lengths, the variance will drop a lot at large block lengths. Uh, let's suggest the segmentation indeed helps address the inhomogeneous issue. And then when we look at the conclusion, we find out uh, for this specific experiment, regardless of the block length and the segmentation choice, there is strong association between the DE genes and DA peaks. This is what we expected for this data set because it is the API cell lines with the minimum technical variation and a strong treatment stimulate the inferon gamma. So we expect there will be high enrichment of the differential acceptability near the differential expression genes. But however, in some cases, there will be, uh, if you've seen the uh, um, shuffling or the unsegmentation block bootstrapping to result a significant conclusion while using the hidden Markov model with the block a bootstrap will have non-significant result. And although we are not showing here, but we actually have evaluate the block length by using the KL divergence of the interfacial distance and find out uh, the hidden Markov model with 200 kilo base pair block lengths are most uh, resemble uh, close to the original interfacial distance. So uh, yeah, but, um, look at a green line is more appropriate for this kind of genome analysis. Then for usage, we have the segment density functions uh, provide HMM or the CBS as a uh, alternative segmentation method. And we have the plot segment function to generate a several QC plot. Uh, here we find out HMM actually can generate more segment pieces than the CPS, which may capture more appropriate uh, homogeneous region. However, it's not to more segments better because it may miss the, uh, the ideal block length choice and uh, it may uh, slow down the computation time. For running the boot block bootstrap, we have the boot ranges function given x as the feature set. And this SAC argument can be user defined using their own segmentation method or the result from our segmentation density. The, also, we have option to give the deny ranges, that is the excluded ranges, uh, less the ranges that users want to be excluded, like the central mayor regions. Also, we can run within or across the crop zone. Right now, we are working with the Stuart Lee, the author of the PR ranges, to hopefully users can easily run parallel within this parallel uh, pipeline. In future, to avoid uh, after really picking a lock for change threshold for the differential expression genes on this overlapping test, we have fitted the uh, uh, splines of peak count over the lock for change indicated by this blue uh, black line. And uh, great, we find out there's bumps actually with a higher log for change. And the red curves indicate 200 splines of uh, fit to overlap count, 
by the agents to the bootstrap picks, and we are interested to find the log for change threshold uh, uh, place where the observed peak count are some amount more than the bootstrap peaks. Right now, what I have introduced is uh, to generating the non-site uh, based on the original value. Uh, and another part of our project leaded by Eric Davis is to generating the non-site based on the original value. For example, the non-differential expression genes and by controlling several covariates. So if you are interested, feel free to go to tomorrow's poster session on 3 p.m. Pacific and 6 p.m. Eastern. And uh, finally, thanks to the Bell Conductor Conference to give me opportunity to introduce the non-ranges project and thanks to uh, my advisor, Dr. Michael Love, to guiding me this evening and help me implementing the packages. Thanks Dr. Eric Stewart, Mikhail, and team for all the wonderful and valuable suggestions. Thanks Chen Zapkur for funding this project. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask or discuss with us in the Slack channel. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Watson. Um, I'm going to, now introduce our next, our second speaker, Tumai Chapraz, um, who's going to speak about feature selection by replicate reproducibility and non-redundancy. Thank you. So I hope you can see the slides. Sounds good or looks good. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work today. And um, I'm a PhD student of the Huber Group at EMBL Heidelberg, and I'm going to talk about feature selection, how we can make use of uh, replicate reproducibility to do this. First of all, feature selection is a method to reduce the dimension of a data set. And it's uh, performed by, or it's usually just the process of selecting the most relevant features of a data set to reduce the dimensionality. And this can be both performed unsupervised and supervised. And there are three main approaches to do so. Um, the, uh, the wrapper methods, when we first search for feature subsets and then evalu evaluate them on the performance of a model, for example, a classifier or clustering algorithm. But these methods are usually quite computationally expensive. Then there are embedded methods where the feature selection is directly embedded into model fitting. And an uh, example for this would be, for example, linear models with a lasso penalty regularization or decision trees. And then there are filter methods which ev evaluate the features and the intrinsic properties of the data. They're usually fast and simple. And one very famous uh, example is the selection of highly variable genes. And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, about the unsupervised filter method we came up with. And I want to highlight its, its use in the context of um, uh, image analysis. And yeah, image data is intrinsically high dimensional because it's just these fields of pixels, usually with multiple channels of colors. And one way to analyze these is using neural networks, which also have some especially convolution, convolutional neural networks have also some sort of feature extraction and selection of the inbuilt, or use a direct feature extraction algorithm, and such as the R package EB image, where we first uh, segment the image. So this is shown on the left, where we have this uh, nuclei stained in blue, then segmented on the bottom row. And, uh, and then we extract, when, once we have identified the objects in the image, extract certain features, geometric features, or yeah, others. But, how, but this, as I will show in a minute, often produces uh, highly correlated features and often some noisy features which are not really reproducible between the replicates. So um, as an example here, again, this picture of uh, this segmented nuclei, one example of an extracted feature could be the cell count and the counting of the nuclei, or some shape features, for example, the major axis length of, of, of this circular 
uh, or elliptic uh, nuclei. Eccentricity, which is some sort of um, ratio between major and minor axes, not exactly, but uh, a measure for that. Um, the area or shape independent or spatially independent uh, features such as quantile intensity or mean intensity. And what, can, what you can already see is the area feature, for example, is, is of course dependent on the major axis length, so there's some correlation. Um, so, uh, and here's the correlation matrix as an example of a data set where we just extracted the, the features um, with EV image, and you can see that this, there's really these clusters of features. So a former member of our group, Ben Fischer, had the idea of using replicates to find reproducible patterns in these features to, yeah, and also find a unique, a unique set of features. And he used this already in two studies where uh, genetic interactions were studied by means of RNA interference. So samples had cells in, in cells that were combinatorially knocked out genes, always pairs of genes. And then the cells were imaged and the features were extracted. So, and now we took this idea and, and, and formalized it and generalized it further to more than two replicates and also um, yeah, trying to explore the, limit, uh, the capabilities and also limitations and also uh, actually implementing it into an R package called the Feed Seeker, which has the goal to find a non redundant feature subset with high replicate reproducibility. And the ma method can be outlined as follows. We start with a pre selected feature set where we know that this feature set is um, biologically relevant. And then we iteratively model each of the features as a function of the selected feature, just by a linear model. And then and thereby projecting out the dimension of the selected features from the remaining features. And then we select the features based on the reproducibility of the remaining signals. So of, of the uh, remaining signal across the replicates um, so based on the residuals, basically. And so then we stop if there's only noise left. And in a more uh, formal way, we, we have a, is an input with a set of matrices X with N samples and P features our replicates, and our selected features S. And then we rank the features according to the reproducibility in an iterative way. And in each iteration, we fit the linear model for each feature I as a function of all uh, selected features S. And then we select the feature with the highest reproducibility between replicates. And this we uh, exemplify by this function G of the residuals of the feature of and this can be, for example, the correlation between the residuals of all the replicates uh, for a given feature i. And in the next iteration, we, we project out the dimensions spent by the previously selected features by just setting the feature x to its residuals from the previous linear model fit. And try to visualize this a bit. Here, uh, in, in each iteration, we have two steps. On the left, we first fit the linear model, and then we again evaluate the replicate reproducibility. Um, exactly on the left side, we just see for both replicate one and replicate two, we see uh, the, the plot, the selected feature versus the remaining features that will be chosen in this iteration and the linear model. And on the right, we see the residuals plotted against each other from these two linear model fits. And we see the remaining signals after projecting out the first uh, feature. Um, the, the remaining signal is quite very good reproducible between the two replicates. We have a Pearson correlation of 0.97. Um, after in the fifth iteration, you can see this, this low, um, correlation becomes lower because you already projected out five features, but still is quite high. In the tenth iteration, even lower, and finally at the final iteration at 18, uh, we can see that the residuals do not agree very well or do not correlate very well with each other, and we have just have these blobs centered around zero because we already projected out 18 features from the whole data set. So, um, and this is how the whole correlation matrix of the selected features looks like. This is, these were selected from around 6,000 samples, two replicates, and 216 features in, in total. 
And as a starting point, we use the count feature because we assume that sort of the cell counts should have some biological meaning. Uh, yeah, and also what I uh, yeah, wanted to say is that the count feature should also be reproducible between replicates because it's um, we really want to get rid of these technical features, which are sort of which can be handy for some applications, but it are produced by these feature extraction algorithms, but are not always that useful because they're not reproducible between the replicates. Um, and it's also interesting to not only look at the, just at the correlation matrix, so you can also look at these two metrics. For example, first uh, the, the variance explained of the remaining features by the selected features, which is in this case just the, the, the average um, coefficient of determination when modeling each of the remaining features as a function of the selected features, which is shown here in red. Um, and on the x-axis, we have the selected number of features, and uh, the vertical line shows our set of 18 features. And also, it's interesting to look at the redundancy of the selected feature set, because the more features we select, the more redundant also becomes our feature subset. And here, uh, we are using uh, SVD entropy, which was already previously used as a metric for feature selection, and it's based on uh, the entropy of the normalized singular values when doing a uh, singular value decomposition on the feature subset that you selected. And sort of an entropy of one um, says that the variance is equally distributed uh, along your data set, and an entropy of zero would be that basically your, your feature subset is of rank one and sort of very redundant. And with this, I'm already at the end of my talk, and I would uh, like to thank my supervisor, Wolfgang Huber, for his guidance and for, uh, yeah, for his comments, my work. Also, Simone Bell for all her support and also for uh, uh, participating in the organization of this conference. Uh, the rest of the lab for their critical comments and feedback. My funders, the organizers of this conference, and of course, you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. So we'll take questions um, at the end. I see someone's already put a question in, which is great. Um, please keep those questions coming. Um, I'm now going to introduce our third speaker, um, who is Simone um, Tiberi, uh, who's going to speak about um, uh, bandits package, which is for Bayesian differential splicing accounting for sample to sample variability and mapping uncertainty. There's a video. Monique Berry, I am a postdoc at Mark Robinson's lab in Zurich, where I develop statistical methods for bioinformatics. Now, distinct is actually our latest method, but today I'm going to present Bandits, which uh, was released last year. Now, Bandits is a Bayesian hierarchical model to identify differential alternative splicing events from bulk RNA-seq data. Differential alternative splicing trivially studies how alternative splicing patterns change between uh, conditions, and the method is on the conductor. Now, mathematically, the biggest issue when you work with transcript-level counts is that these are not observed directly. And so they have to be estimated. And you can infer them with tools like Salmon or Callisto, but then you should propagate forward in the downstream analysis the uncertainty in these estimates. And that is non-trivial. So with bandits instead, we avoid the quantification and we actually input directly the equivalence classes of reads, which are basically the list of transcripts that each read is compatible with. Now, in this example here, where you have two transcripts, we will have that one read here is compatible with the blue transcript only, two reads are compatible with the red one, and seven reads are multi-mapping reads that are compatible with both blue and red transcripts. So in Bandits, what we do is to treat the allocation of these uh, seven multi-mapping reads as a latent state, uh, which is basically a parameter that we sampled within our model. And we do that both for transcript, but also for gene uh, um, allocations in case reads are compatible with multiple genes. So 
Consider a classical scenario where you have a gene with K transcripts and you observe N, uh, N samples, N biological replicates uh, for a given group. Now, the transcript level counts for an individual, the I individual, are assumed to follow a multinomial distribution with parameter pi here that indicates the relative abundance of transcripts. Now, in order to allow for sample to sample variability, we let pi i vary between samples. And so we assume that a priori um, pi is distributed like a Dirichlet distribution. And so we have a canonical Dirichlet multinomial hierarchical model or mixed effect model in the frequency statistic. Now, the delta parameter of the Dirichlet uh, can be decomposed in two parts for interpretability. Uh, the first one, uh, represented by the summation of the deltas, is the precision parameter, and it indicates the degree of overdispersion. So what is the uh, sample to sample variability? And then pi bar that indicates the relative abundance of transcripts averaged across all your samples. And so that is the mean relative abundance of the group. Now to enhance inference, we also formulate an informative prior for the precision parameter from all the other genes. Uh, and so we follow a similar conceptual approach to what, uh, for instance, a JAR and DC2 do for um, uh, the dispersion parameter of the negative binomial model. Now, we infer then the parameters of the model with a full MCMC approach, where we alternately sample from the conditional distributions of the, the hyperparameters of the Dirichlet delta, the sample specific hierarchical parameters um, of the multinomial pi, and the Leben states, so the gene and transcript uh, allocation of reads. That basically in the end gives us the transcript estimated counts. Uh, we cannot obviously assess the convergence of the chains uh, by eye, given that this is run for every gene. Um, but we do check with a stationarity test if the chains, if all the posterior chains have reached convergence. And if not, we will run them uh, and eventually output uh, an error message for those specific genes. We also correct for the, uh, the different lengths of various transcripts because obviously the number of reads that you observe for a transcript depend on the uh, relative, of, on the actual probability of expressing the transcript, but also on its length. And so we uh, divide the probability that a read comes from a transcript by its effective length. Um, and then we rescale the denominator simply to make sure that this pi adds to one and it's a probability. And so this gives us pi t, which is the probability of actually expressing a transcript in terms of a uh, biological unit. And so when we do differential testing between conditions, we, te we don't test the pi, the original pi bar that concerns the number of reads you observe, but we test this new pi t parameter. Uh, and so we test the entire vector pi t when we perform a gene level test between conditions, and we test the individual pi k parameter when we perform a transcript level test. And mathematically, what we do is we uh, approximate the posterior densities with the normal, and then we fit a multivariate wall test on top of that. We additionally also provide, sorry, a conservative score, which is bandit's in here, that accounts for the inversion of the dominant transcript. So the rationale here is that the majority of alternative of differential alternative splicing events have the inversion of the dominant transcript, which is the, the main transcript in the, in the gene. And so when the dominant transcript is the same across conditions, we inflate p-values. So we push them to one by taking the square root of the, of the p-values. Computational-wise, uh, the method is coded in C++ and it runs in parallel, so it is relatively uh, computationally efficient. I performed various benchmarks, and these are the main ones I'm going to show you. Um, a six versus six two group comparison from a human genome, and a three versus three two group comparison from uh, a real data set, again, human genome, uh, where 82 genes have been validated with, uh, with PCR. 
Now, we benchmark Bandit, which, which is in green here, against various competitors. And so here we have the true positive versus false discovery rate at the gene level. So this is a gene level test. And you see Bandit is in green here. It has good true positive rate, but also controls for the, for, for the actual false discovery rate. And similarly, when you look at the transcript level test, um, well, obviously there are much fewer uh, competitors because not all methods provide um, a, a transcript level test. Uh, also on the real data set, uh, Ben Mithier has, uh, has good performance. This is a rock curve and it can recover or order um, quite fairly well the 82, these 82 validity genes. Obviously, this is a rougher comparison because we, we have a ground truth for these 82 validity genes, but not for the remaining ones. And so we assume that there is no effect in the remaining ones, but well, this is trivially um, not exact. Computational wise, we have here the um, overall cost on the left of the full pipeline, including alignment and quantification in blue, and the differential uh, part in red. And then on the right, we zoom in basically these fastest methods that share the same quantification and alignment so that we can better appreciate their differences in the actual uh, differential methods. Uh, and I think the few key points are that Bennett is obviously much lower than um, competitors that do not um, have the allocation of the uh, latent variables, but it also is much faster than alternative approaches. And overall, when we consider the full cost, including alignment and quantification, um, the marginal increase here, so the, the increase of these uh, few minutes uh, in the bandit provides is I think overall a very marginal increase in the cost of the, of the full pipeline. Now, to briefly wrap up, uh, Bennett can input uh, weeds that are aligned with pseudo aligners like Salmon and Callisto or with full aligners like SAR, so it gives users uh, flexibility. It works with equivalence classes and then it treats the transcript and sometimes gene allocation of reads as a latent variable. It has a hierarchical structure that models the sample to sample variability. It can test for differences at the gene and transcript level. It corrects for the effective lengths of transcripts, and it is relatively efficient. Uh, and it has, I think, good performance in all our benchmarks. The method is on back conductor. It was published last year, if, you, if you're interested in more details. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge Mark for supervising me and the entire, the entire Robinson lab for, for their contributions and suggestions throughout the, the project. And thank you for, for your attention. Those are three really good talks. Um, I see we have some questions in the uh, Q&A section. Um, so I see a question here that uh, I'm just going to go from the bottom up because those are the oldest ones. So this first question, um, I believe, was aimed actually at Tumai. Um, how to make the balance between variance and SVD entropy here? Yeah. So as you identified already, it's a balance, it's a trade-off. And yeah, I just use it to, to, to evaluate the feature set and the balance. You can either maximize just both or, for example, just set this um, the fraction of variance explained that you want to cover and then use the lowest amount of redundancy for the feature set. So, and then I see a question here for, for Wanson. Um, what hidden states does the HMM estimate? Oh, we are performing the segmentation based on the gene density. So it will estimate three states, high density, middle, and low density region, yeah. I see another question for Tumai. Um, can your R package handle multiple like five or 10 replicates? Yes, an arbitrary number. And I see, I think these last two questions are for uh, Simone. 
Um, the first one is, could you speak more to the interpretation of the delta decomposition? Um, yeah, so basically the, um, this is the canonical, um, I feel like the Richelieu multinomial um, hierarchical model. So the delta, um, kind of the delta is like, is a, is a vector of k values, one per transcript in our case, and each value is between zero and infinity, so it's, it's, it's positive. Uh, so the, the easiest way to interpret that, because there's not much interpretation about these values per se, is to consider the, you know, the, the dispersion of precision parameter, anyway, the summation of, the, of these deltas that concern the sample to sample variability. And then normalize the, these deltas by the summation of the delta, uh, because that gives what I call pi bar, and that pi bar is the, um, the, the average abundance of the transcripts, but averaged across all the samples. So it represents basically the pi bar is a group level relative abundance of the transcripts, and then the dispersion is, uh, or precision is, uh, you know, it's, it's one is the inverse of the other one, tells you how this pi bar uh, varies from sample to sample within a group. Uh, Mark, should I go for the next question? It's still for me. Go for it. Go for it, thank you. Uh, so did you compare your results with our maths? No, we haven't done that. Um, so there are a lot of tools to perform differential splicing from um, RNA-seq data. So we haven't considered all of them. Uh, what I did at the time was to pick the kind of, what I found to be the kind of the best performing methods in other papers. Uh, so I know our math, is, our math is quite popular and it does uh, pretty well. Uh, we might have excluded it because there were tools that were performing better in external benchmarks, but uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure anymore. But anyway, I haven't really checked that. There's another question for Simone. Do you have thoughts on finding rare splicing events while also controlling for mapping uncertainty? Uh, with Mike, with events, do you mean um, like differential splicing in general or the specific event, like uh, what SUPA2 does, so identifying, I don't know, intron retention, exon skipping, and so on? Did you in general? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So Mike said, like, DTU in general that may occur in a few samples in a group, but maybe not affect the mean much. Uh, I haven't thought too much about it, and I haven't uh, explored the subset of possible uh, events like this one. Um, I, so I, I don't know, I, don't have a, uh, I haven't done a benchmark on this specific case. Uh, I mean, of course, it, I think it is going to affect I mean, it's, it's an obvious question, but of course I think it is going to uh, be hard to detect with any method you use. So I think it's going to affect the, you know, the power of all the methods. I, I, I don't know, honestly, in particular about ours. I think in general, hierarchical models, I mean, not just ours, but all the methods that have uh, hierarchy, like mixed effects or hierarchical models are going to have a little bit more power in detecting these events because they do gather information from uh, from multiple samples, but I don't, I don't have a, a more detailed answer. Thank you for listening. Are there any other questions for our uh, our speakers? No raised hands. Nobody's brave today. Okay. Well, those were. Um, I really enjoyed those talks. Um, I hope everyone else did. Um, Give everybody a, an emoji round of applause, and uh, and I guess we'll close the session. Thanks, everyone.